The most familiar form of magnetism is ferromagnetism, so much so that the things people call magnets are almost all made of ferromagnetic materials, often iron, nickel, cobalt, or their alloys. What causes materials to be ferromagnetic is electrons in the material's atoms. Every electron has spin, which is an intrinsic property of the electron and can only be up or down. Spin also produces a magnetic moment, causing electrons to act as though they are little magnets. Within an atom, some electrons are paired together and oppose each other's magnetic effects, canceling out. The unpaired electrons, meanwhile, align with each other, causing their magnetic moments to add together, giving the atom therein a net magnetic moment. Unpaired electrons also try to align with the electrons in other atoms. In ferromagnetic materials, this tendency is strong enough to overcome the other forces in the material and align nearby atoms, creating areas in a ferromagnet called domains, where all spins are aligned. On the graph shown, the horizontal axis plus the strength of an external magnetic field being applied, and the vertical axis plus the resulting strength of the hypothetical ferromagnet in that field. In an unmagnetized material, the domains point randomly and counteract each other, leaving zero overall moment as indicated by the point placed on the graph. If an external magnetic field is applied, then the domains which are aligned with the field will grow at their edges as spins rotate to align to the field and thus to those domains. This increases the magnetization of the material and produces its own magnetic moment. Eventually, the entire magnet will consist of a single domain aligned with the external field in a state called saturation. Since the entire ma magnet is made up of a single domain, it cannot be magnetized any further, even if an external field is strengthened. If the field is then weakened, magnetization will decrease, but the largest domains do not shrink all the way back to their original size, leaving some magnetization even when there is zero external field. The remaining magnetization is called remnants. The reason we can simply pick up a ferromagnet and it already has magnetic properties is because of its remnant magnetization. If a field is then applied in the opposite direction, the domains facing the original direction shrink and the domains aligned with the new direction grow. Because of the remnants, some of Earth's fields needed simply to get back to zero magnetization. The strength of the field in the opposite direction required is called coercivity. Completing the graph for a full loop, we can see that because of a magnet's previous magnetization, it will take on different magnetization even when the same external field is being applied. This phenomenon is known as hysteresis. Isotropic objects have properties that are the same no matter what orientation the properties are measured from. The center of a sphere, as an example, is isotropic. The properties of an anisotropic object, on the other hand, differ when orientation changes. Consider the anisotropy of a bar magnet. Usually bar magnets are magnetized across their longest side, as shown on the left, but they certainly don't have to be. To figure out why they usually are, let's again treat the domains as if they are small magnets. If you've played around with magnets before, you understand that the closer they are together, the stronger they interact. Putting together the domains lengthwise causes more attractive interactions to form close together, whereas putting together the magnets side to side creates more repulsive interactions close together. Just as it is more difficult to hold together a collection of magnets side to side by hand, it is more difficult for an external magnetic field to hold side side domains together, making the longest axes of a magnet the easiest to align. This is known as shape anisotropy. At Fair Thin Film Labs, we are of course concerned with thin films. We expect that the longer in-plane axis of a film is easier to magnetize than the shorter out-of-plane axis, at least if we base our predictions solely on shape anisotropy. Shown is the data collected at the lab for nickel cobalt oxide. The graph has the same axis as the previous hysteresis loop we've shown, where the strength of the magnet is plotted vertically against the strength of the field it is in plotted horizontally. The in-plane axis shows very minimal coercivity and remnants. The outer plane axis could not be more different. The remnants is nearly as large as the saturation magnetization, and the coercivity is nearly as large as the field required to saturate the magnet. Comparing the two graphs on the same scale clearly shows that the in-plane axis is much more difficult to magnetize, and necessitating far stronger fields to get to the same magnetic moments. Because of the discrepancy with shape anisotropy, we know that nickel cobalt oxide must have a different form of anisotropy giving it this behavior, such as the anisotropy arising from crystal structure. So what precisely do we mean by crystal structure? Well, crystals describe any solids which have a repeating arrangement of atoms, such as table salt, known chemically as sodium chloride. Crystal structure is best described by a unit cell, which can then be stacked and repeated to form larger parts of the crystal. Shown are a few possible orientations of the sodium chloride crystal, and in just these three views, there is variation in the distances between atoms, their offsets, how they alternate, the shapes that appear between them, and so on. There is, in short, anisotropy. 
Several axes are shown for the unit cell of iron, and just like with the sodium chloride crystal, there are differences in the distances between atoms, their offsets, how they alternate, the shapes that appear between them, and so on. The difference between iron and sodium chloride is that each atom of iron has a magnetic moment, and the anisotropy of the crystal in turn influences how the magnetic moments interact, causing anisotropy for magnetic properties. I hope you enjoyed watching the video and understand something about ferromagnetism as well as how it relates to our work here at Ferrothin Film Labs.